This is the Dreadful Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. It's part four of our look back at Penny Dreadful. We're on season two, episodes five to seven. Welcome back to part four of the Dreadful Podcast, Penny Faithful. This is TV Podcast Industries. We're watching Penny Dreadful, season two, episodes five to seven. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow Darklings and Nightcomers. Yes, this is the Dreadful Podcast, and we are looking at Penny Dreadful. Uh, I am one of your other hosts, John. Yeah, welcome back, just to do this this time. Yes, absolutely. Getting into our spoiler-filled rewatch of Penny Dreadful Season 2, with this episode above the vaulted sky. Mm -hmm. Yes, those dolls do return um, (laughs) in a rather harrowing sense uh, for poor old Gladys. And yes, this is very much the witching hour for um, a bit of slap and tickle, no less. (laughs) Yes, this is the sexy episode. It really is, yes. (laughs) Lots of love in the air, I think, as uh, as, uh, Vanessa calls out at one point uh, later on in the the series. Um, Just to mention again, we are talking about Penny Dreadful because we're leading up to the launch of Penny Dreadful City of Angels. A brand new trailer came out this week as we're recording this episode um, for the series. And yes, it looks really, really interesting. So excited to see what Natalie Dormer brings to this show. Loved her on Game of Thrones. And she's one of those actresses that just is is someone that you've really got to watch. So uh, what this show did for Eva Green uh, for us, we put her on this absolute wonderful pedestal of acting. I'm wondering if Natalie Dormer could even possibly match up to that. But I'm really excited to see what she is given to do in, in that show uh, really excited to get there and as the more we watch this series of penny dreadful the more excited i'm getting for uh, city of angels when it comes we're hoping you're enjoying your rewatch of the show along with us uh, a massive thank you to everybody over in our patreon group who's been supporting us uh, for the last couple of months leading up to these releases so we're giving them to our followers over on patreon first and then they're going out in our main feed on tv podcast industries and we will have a unique feed for all of our penny dreadful coverage as we do with all of our shows uh, so you can just get all of the penny dreadful episodes uh, in one feed at one time if that's the one show that you want to follow and not all the other stuff that we cover yes absolutely so penny faithful please remember to subscribe to the podcast over on tv podcastindustries.com you can get any good or evil podcast catcher of your choice to listen to us mm-hmm and if you want to get early access to any of the episodes, you can go over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. Support us there and you can get access to any of the episodes that we've been releasing over there for our Penny Dreadful rewatch. Let's get into our episode discussion about Season 2, Episode 5, Above the Vaulted Sky. This episode was directed by Damon Thomas. This is the second episode of Penny Dreadful that he's directed, but has four others in Season 3. Uh, recently, he directed seven episodes of Killing Eve, one of the biggest shows in the world, really. So, uh, yeah. yeah, definitely interesting to see what he's done over there on on, uh, Killing Eve. Uh, He also recently directed the Dracula reboot series, directed one of the episodes of that, the second episode, the one that was set on the ship traveling from Transylvania to London, funnily named Blood Vessel, which I really like. Excellent stuff. Uh, (laughs) Nice and macabre there, I think. And, you know, working with vampires, working uh, working with some really interesting ideas in that series as they were trying to set it up for a brand new take, a reboot of the universe of Dracula, trying to get him into present day, really. So... I don't know whether it worked for everybody uh, as a show. I don't know whether they will come back with a second season of that. But what Damon Thomas got to do on that episode of the trip across the ocean is a very standard Dracula story. And there was some great stuff in there, some really good uh, Easter eggs in there for fans of the Dracula genre, I suppose, if you want to say that, the vampire genre, I'd say. And I've said before, I'm a big fan of vampires. So uh, it hit me in the right place, that series. Really enjoyed that. What, in the neck with... uh two bite marks Mm, yes (laughs) right there right there Uh, the episode once again was written by showrunner john logan as always uh, for these episodes so far john do you want to tell us what they gave us with the summary for this episode sure so malcolm and the others prepare for an attack on their home by the nightcomers 
Elsewhere, Inspector Rush questions Ethan as to why he has recently been buying a large amount of ammunition. Meanwhile, Madame Carly seduces Sir Malcolm and uses a voodoo doll to inflict great pain on Sorn, who is standing in her way. The creature challenges Victor Frankenstein and insists on seeing Lily, but when he does so, it's clear that she does not love him. However, when Lily, Victor and Vanessa go for dinner, it's clear to Vanessa that he is very much in love with her. Yes. Mm -hmm. His cousin, who's not really his cousin, (laughs) who he brought back to life. Yes. Just wrong, Victor. Just so, so wrong. I think I have her described as his formerly dead made-up cousin. Uh, (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) But I I did think it was quite interesting, Vanessa being in this close proximity with Lily, uh, as we know, formerly uh, Brona, uh, and no recognition crossing her face as to the fact that she may have met Brona in the past. I think she did Um, at the theatre. Hmm. Uh, at the Grand Guignol, uh, that moment where it is um, Ethan and Brona yes. ha- have gone to, to see the, I think it was a werewolf, mm-hmm. um, Penny Dreadful, that is being uh, put on at the theatre. That's right. Um, but also there is Dorian Gray and Vanessa, but Brona kind of runs out um Feeling, I suppose, somewhat out of place mm-hmm. uh, in that company. But certainly it seems as though um, Vanessa doesn't recognize Lily here mm-hmm. in this guise. I think it's it, the accent. It's the accent. It's the accent. But th- there is also that other great moment in the typhoid ward or underneath the railway line mm-hmm. where Vanessa and John Clare both are talking about Victor and Lily to one another. Yeah. But in different guises. Not knowing um, the yeah, yeah, exactly. Really so it, that's that's a nice little sort of moment because there is that talk of, I think in the following episode, where Vanessa mentions to Victor that she has met John Clare um, and he knows immediately that it's Caliban, his, his former firstborn. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that, you know, they have this discussion as to what um and why they have been brought together there must be some kind of design um and that it's, it's is it fate or is it by chance and you know this is all kind of starting to potentially weave um a complicated web mm-hmm. um between the this group of people Absolutely. for sure you know brona has quite a lot of uh links now to that company whether it be ethan vanessa um or through John Clare to Victor. Yeah, so exactly. yes, this is this is kind of uh, really quite interesting, yeah, and indeed Dorian Gray um, of with the pornography shoot. Yeah, of course, of course. If you've been following along with our coverage of Penny Dreadful, you know that we take one big moment from each of these episodes as we're reviewing them. When we do get to Penny Dreadful, City of Angels, we we'll do a more traditional uh, discussion about everything that happens in the episodes. But as we're doing the rewatch, we're picking out the things that stood out to us from each individual episode. So, John, do you want to give us the big moment that stood out to you? from episode five of Penny Dreadful season two. Well, this was absolutely the sexing hour on Penny Dreadful. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a storm and my God, there was a storm amongst the bed sheets. Uh A lot of raining, a lot of ravaging going on. Yes. But I really enjoyed this because we've really been seeing that pent up desire, I suppose, amongst uh, these people, the frustration of it to some respect. And with the lightning storm came this huge release and a clearing of the air between mm. a number of the, the different people. And I really quite liked this narrative on, on love, desire, sex across many different ways between the people in this show, between mm-hmm. the, the characters. I, I, th- I thought it was really, really well done. You know, you, you have love as exploitation, really, with Evelyn trying to seduce Sir Malcolm for her own ends, you know, yeah. to use him, uh, to get close to Vanessa, but also um, for other reasons, as we see in the next episode. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- this is very much one of pure exploitation of, of Sir Malcolm's uh, feelings here. Yes. Um, but you also have love as acceptance here by Dorian towards Angelique, celebrating the difference that is Angelique, celebrating the um, the, the, the wagging tongues of people um, disapproving. You know, this is his, this is what he lives for. And, and, and I suppose with that, there is this, 
selfish side note for Dorian that he always has to um, advance on to the next great controversy or or new thing. Yeah. And I think we begin to see some element of that uh, over these next uh, three episodes mm-hmm. as well between him and Lily. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as well then love as something uh, new um for victor primarily uh, towards lily he's always kept himself um at a distance towards attachment certainly with the death of his dog and his mother as we saw in season 1 That's right. but now here uh, we see him with yes as you say his made up dead cousin uh, <laughs> effectively um with lily mm-hmm. but again that's an interesting contrast with lily who is in her former self as Broner, very much uh, comfortable around uh, her body and yeah. having sex because she was a whore yeah. um, and she got paid for that. So, um, but not aware of that um, in her new guise as Lily, yeah. it, it it is something potentially new for her as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and of course, with Victor and Lily, you have the love as something um, that is awkward or or seen as a risk mm. by John Clare uh, that he talks uh, with Vanessa about. And I, I really like this. You know, he's very nervous of his new bride. He's afraid of rejection. You know, he feels awkward around love. It, it's opening up the heart to then be controlled by that emotion. Mm. Um, and he's not sure how to navigate these waters of, of love as he talks to, to Vanessa about uh, being effectively unlucky in love. So he has real trepidation around it. Well, yeah. Uh, um, and, and so does uh, Vanessa, actually, with um, effectively her possessions being sort of spurred on by sexual intercourse mm. uh, with Mina's um, husband-to-be and then with Dorian yeah. um, in season one. So, you know, all of this and then the big love that cannot happen and um, the, the, the love that can't take flight between Vanessa and Ethan mm-hmm. because of who they are and because of their relationship to one another, which gets teased out, I think, in episode seven more, actually, um, from, from Mr. Lyle. Yep. But certainly at the moment, Vanessa is wary of any th- intimacy uh, because of the possession that she knows of took hold of her from that. She, so she's really kind of recoiling from that. So whatever the feelings there might be between uh, Vanessa and Ethan, it's something that they can't act on. And Ethan, because he certainly doesn't want to be making love during a full moon, otherwise <laughs> um, that doggy style is going to get really <laughs> dangerous. It definitely will. You may lose your throat in that moment. <laughs> Absolutely. <yeah. laughs> so I really just liked how all of this complex web of these people came together and there were touch points between different people and just this whole um, narrative and exploration of love and sex. You know, it, it was it was really, really good. Yeah, there's so much going on in this episode with all of these relationships culminating in one moment, really, culminating in, in these moments in this episode. Um, you know, everybody uh, seems to be coupling up at the same time. You know, you, you talked about Caliban and uh, John Clare um, feeling that he's not able to be uh, to be with his new wife, I suppose, the, the new bride of Frankenstein, I suppose. Um, but that all came out of him going to Victor and effectively forcing him to release Lily to him to to make good on his uh, promise that uh, Lily would come to him as his bride. But we find that what actually has happened is Victor has given her the choice. She can now make up her own mind as to who the ch- who she is to be in love with. Uh, something he'll probably come to regret as the episodes go on. But at this moment, he's doing it because he's fallen in love with Lily and yeah. doesn't want to tell John Clare about it. But given the choice, really, Lily chooses not to go with John Clare, not saying it. She doesn't say that she's not going to go with him, but she feels completely standoffish towards this person that she's supposed to be betrothed to. You know, that's the the lie that they've told um, Lily is that she was formally engaged to this man to be married, and now she's lost her memory after an accident. Um, but she should go back to him if she feels that's the right thing to do. So, um, so quite a 
a twist, I suppose, yeah. from from Victor, particularly because Victor's telling John Clare, you wouldn't be the kind of man that would force a woman to be with you, would you? Kind of thing. And the reason why he's saying that is because he wants Lily to be with him. Yeah, right? exactly. And and John Clare is, you know, he's afraid of the rejection, but what Victor has said to her, you know, how he has been painted to her by, by him. Mm-hmm. And of course, yeah, she, Lily has absolutely no recollection of him. And neither should she, even if she were tapping into Broner's memories. Yeah. Um, but she does say, let's be friends to start. I can do no other. Yeah. I, it, it is almost a smack in the gut for John Clare, Caliban, mm-hmm. the creature, the firstborn, because, <laughs> um, he, he just thought it was going to be almost, make a date effectively mm-hmm. by Victor to yeah. create this person who would be with him. He, you know, he is very sophisticated now. He, he's very well learned. He has evolved and developed in, in that sense from the creature. You know, we saw how Proteus, uh, as well as himself and with Lily coming in, having to learn and, uh, and develop. Mm-hmm. And he feels that he would be able to mold her. Um, and in a sense, Victor has done that, and that's where her affection, um, at least her her most social contact, has yeah. come from, not with him. So maybe Victor should have left it to to John Clare to do the the teachings yeah. in a sense, and maybe something would have been a little bit different. Absolutely. Um, I think the really nice thing I, I love the I, I love the the phrase used um, just coming on to. Sir Malcolm and Evelyn Poole at the the opera, uh, where also Dorian and Angelique are as well. She she has a great line where she says, "Damn baubles of our vanity," because she has um, a ring with a little needle on it that she oh, pricks yes. Sir Malcolm with, and this kind of leads um, him, I presume, with some kind of magic around it uh, to become infatuated. You know, they're kissing in the rain and very impulsively. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sir Malcolm says, I have to be with you now yeah. uh, as they take a hotel room. So one small prick should be uh, rewarded by, <laughs> dare I say it, <laughs> another. Um, but, yes. you know, th- this is really, again, just Evelyn using uh, the- these little bits of magic mm-hmm. and her, her sharp rings my goodness uh, you wouldn't want to shake hands with her in any yeah. way she's used it to kill one of her daughters mm-hmm. uh, for failing her and now she's using a, a different ring to uh, effectively inject some poison or not poison but some kind of magic mm-hmm. uh to to change some alchem absolutely to influence whatever he does i suppose as well yeah she also remember used it to kill multiple cows uh, on the moors and that as well, as well. So, yeah exactly uh, hopefully she washes that ring i'm um, sure she does <laughs> i'm sure she takes care of it but let's talk a little bit about about dorian and angelique's uh, moments together because this comes out of another of those um moments within Victorian society where we see this group of a-holes, as I'm just absolutely going to refer them. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. um, Who try to uh, completely embarrass Angelique when she's being brought out to this uh, high society moment with Dorian being brought into this uh, this group, effectively. And they're spitting on her, they're shouting at her. um, And then we see that it takes its toll on her. We have this wonderful uh, discussion between Angelique and uh, and Dorian back at his house where she's dressing back up as a as a boy and yeah. um, saying that will just make life easier if I dress like this you know yes okay people will still point fingers at me but I'm just done with the fight um I I kind of love this because I've said before that Dorian is a very despicable character he's been going from one person to the next over and over throughout his life getting away with whatever he wants to and for once this feels like he really does truly um, want to relieve some of the stress and tension that's there within Angelique about what she has to do in fighting every day to prove that she is the person that she is, you know? And there does feel like some really good connection between Dorian and her. It feels like he's actually using the knowledge that he's built up and the experience that he's built up to help somebody else within this society. And that's something that I don't feel, even in the conversations with Vanessa that he had before, um, I don't feel that he has really done anything good with the experiences that he's had other than good for himself. Yeah. It just feels like this time with Angelique, he's really using those, the knowledge that he's built up to, to kind of say, right, 
the fight may be difficult, but it's worth it. You yes. get to be yourself. You get to be whoever you want to be. Uh, absolutely. I, I think it's interesting with Dorian and Angelique because I think because of the way he um deals with what angelique is doing you know in dressing back in in men's clothing uh you know saying that he's tired of fighting um and you know he's only fit for whoring and degradation is how he describes it yeah. i think that's why i said dorian you know it was love as acceptance because he's providing this acceptance i do think equally you could say it's love as exploitation for dorian because he is doing this yeah. in order to Ret- almost retain Angelique uh, as well, I think, to some extent. And I think we might see that a little further down the tracks. Yeah. This idea that for Dorian, it is about always moving towards the latest new thing. Yeah. I mean, Angelique in some ways calls it out with, you prefer the freak. It is a spice for you. Mm-hmm. And it's that kind of notion. Without it. For Dorian, it's an addiction what yeah. he does. And Angelique is the next addiction uh, of uh, uniqueness, uh, nerve and talent, <laughs> dare I say it, that yes. he is, he is trying to be uh, a part of, almost consume. Mm-hmm. That's the same with Vanessa. The only difference is, is that Vanessa has spurned that for the moment, whereas most people get locked into Dorian. Yeah. Um, she hasn't because of what's happened. So you're right on that locking into Dorian. And, and as described in the original novel, the, the picture of Dorian Gray, it, it's also a hollowing out that he does of the people around yeah. him. He takes That's everything. True he wants from them and then leaves them to the side we have very strong characters uh, created by john logan in this show who have been able to kind of get out of the grips of dorian we don't really see very often the people that uh, that he has hollowed out as, as i say we, we don't really see them um and right now as of this episode let's say uh, and as of this part of our discussion from five to seven we haven't seen the ill effect that could come on Angelique from her uh, connection to Dorian. I think in this particular episode, I think it's a really well played uh, part that we have. Angelique's a very strong character yeah. in the show. And to see her kind of falter for a moment and then get bolstered by the direction, I suppose, or the help of Dorian Gray is a really good moment. And it's, it's really well put together. It's, it's beautifully played on screen. Uh, also, we really do have to give a lot of props to this show for the sex scenes themselves. You know, the things that are, that are shown on screen here. I think we both remember, we both watched Queer as Folk, uh, yeah. Russell T. Davis' seminal uh, story of gay life in Manchester. And I remember watching it for the first time back when it came out in, what, 97, 98, I think it was the first season of that show. I remember watching that and it always felt like Russell T. Davis had gone and sat down with the censors and said, I'm going to do about, do a show about sex between gay people. What can I put on screen? How far can I push it? It's kind of the, the way he said it. You know, nothing's particularly shown, but you're seeing a sex scene between two gay men that is just as revealing as the sex scenes between heterosexual partners on a show. And what we have here between in the same kind of way in this show and Penny Dreadful, the sex scene between uh, Angelique and, uh, and Dorian is exactly the same type of sex scene we would have seen on, on Queer as Folk uh, yeah, absolutely. many years before. And you don't see it very often. You really don't see that no. on television very often. And you can see it being paired side by side with the sex scene between Sir Malcolm and Evelyn Poole. That is also the same type of sex scene as you're seeing between Angelique and uh, and Dorian. Um, but I like that they intercut the two of them together, effectively to show there's no real difference between the two. They're television no, exactly. sex scenes. You know? And, and it, it's people who are very comfortable with having sex. And you, you then the contrast is with, with Victor, who's, you know, kind of shakily sort of... St- starting on that journey yeah. with with his made up dead cousin lily um, <laughs> the tentative, tentative uh, two virgins i suppose yeah, between exactly. the two of them not knowing whether it's the right thing to do obviously you know we should also kind of comment i suppose in the victorian era as well there is a little oddness to the fact that he is continually referring to this person as her as his cousin and the conversation with Vanessa never takes that turn of should you be sleeping with your cousin? You know, um, he does reference only once, I think, in a previous episode as like second or third cousin kind of thing. He makes the distinction, but he has made up the backstory of this this young girl coming to visit him who's his cousin from the country. Yeah, absolutely. Yet tells everybody there's a relationship between the yeah. two of them as well. I think as well, back in those days, I think it was 
not unusual mm-hmm. that that would happen. Um, certainly when you were talking uh, about families with land exactly. or whatever, it was very much um, one of the things to do because effectively royalty were doing it. I was going to say, It yeah. was how you maintained your power. Yeah, good um, enough by for kings and queens, good enough for the high society of uh, exactly. Victoria and London, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, the sexual aspect of the show has always been quite central to it right back from season one. It's always been something that's, that's been involved in there. I think this episode, because it involves so much going on between all of these characters, it feels like this is the sexy time episode, as you, as you call the channel. It uh, is well, yeah. sexy. The sexing yeah. hour of Penny Dreadful. Sexy Dreadful. <laughs> but there is other stuff going on in this episode. My, my point for the episode, the big thing that stood out to me really is Evelyn Poole's other magic within the episode. Oh, yeah. Um, wow. These, um, fetish as they're calling them the voodoo dolls that are that that she's creating they're getting more and more gruesome as we go on you know we did see the uh, baby autopsy that provided the heart for Vanessa's um, fetish the doll that they, that was created for her uh, this time we see her opening up the skull of a doll of Gladys Murray Sir Malcolm Murray's wife uh, looking exactly like her even if you hadn't seen her on screen or just saw her for a couple of seconds in the previously on last week's episode kind of thing the doll looks exactly like uh, Gladys and what she does to her uh, in this scene is so brutal yeah. you know the synopsis described it as Madame Callie using a voodoo doll to inflict great pain on someone who is standing in her way yes she does this is you know, opening up, seeing inside, seeing yeah. a brain inside. I'm wondering, you know, instantly what came into my head was, oh, God, that's the baby's brain that she's put inside this doll. Or she's found a brain from somewhere else to put inside here because it's a real brain. Um, it's definitely uh, another thing that she may have been using. Definitely. But putting the nails over and over and over again to drive Gladys mad at this scratching that she's feeling inside her head. Oh, it, it's yeah. crazy. But as it goes on throughout the episode, we cut back to Gladys multiple times and you see what's actually happening is she's being driven completely insane because we have the slight return, let's say, of Mina and Peter, yeah. um, her daughter and son who rise from the grave in her room as she is scraping at her head. Um, like It's really brutal to do this to the a partner of the person that she's trying to control in Sir Malcolm. Um, like realistically, she probably could have done something very simple and just had, you know, killed, done something to the doll to kill herself. But what she's done is she's driven this woman mad to the point of cutting her own throat. Yeah. Um, like that scene where we see those, the first time where she's putting the nails into her head and we have what's five nurses who are on top of uh, of Gladys in her home well, trying no, to it, hold her down. It's, it's like all of her a- maid staff as she's as she's tapping the nails into yeah, her brain. Yeah, it's as she's adding more into mm-hmm. the, the first one. I mean, it it is. I, I found this whole thing really harrowing. It, it, mm-hmm. It's the idea that Gladys is completely powerless. It is the puppet on a string yeah. doing stuff because you have no control over it and uh, because it's been directed by somebody else. And that felt, you know, it's like stamping on spiders or ants. It, it, it felt, you know, that Evelyn Poole was taking a, a, a sledgehammer to crack a walnut yep. in that just go in and kill her and uh, make it short, sharp exactly. and sweet. And um, But the sadistic nature of Evelyn Poole uh, and also to keep her hands, um, you know, squeaky clean from anything a- a- around it. Mm-hmm. it is the reason why she's doing this it, it's it's um being able to be um seven steps removed from it yep. and, and to keep her- herself uh, out of the eyes of, of the law but it's from that very moment where she cracks the skull with the little chisel mm-hmm. to that first strike and that's when she wakes up in bed screaming yeah. and then as she adds more pins into the brain yeah you have that moment where she's being restrained by um four or five nurses and i have to say here noni stapleton who plays gladys i just thought it was a amazing um tour de force of um someone writhing in pain Mm. with the look of just desperation but also you know feeling powerless and the mis comprehension of why is this happening to her mm-hmm. i thought was 
absolutely um, fantastically oh, yeah. acted by uh, Noni Stapleton. Yeah, really, and, really good. Yeah, no, my, it, my brain's itchy just thinking about these these moments. <laughs> and, and, yeah, <laughs> where, exactly. Just this thought of her just being in a completely separate place uh, out in their uh, holiday home, effectively, after she'd broken up with Malcolm in, in the first episode, of saying that she's going to keep her life completely separate from Malcolm, and she's out here alone. Uh, both of her children are dead, no family members around. She just has her staff, effectively. Not actually sure are these are those nurses or are they her maid staff that are trying to hold her down? Uh, not there's a very quick scene, I suppose, yeah. but you can really feel the horror that's coming across her because you know day before absolutely fine and then suddenly waking up screaming seeing these visions of her children and this pain that must yeah. be coming into her brain as she's as she's getting the effects of what's happening from Evelyn Poole. Yeah, and it, it, it serves that purpose of showing the power of this fetish of this doll, mm. and we know of Vanessa's um, fetish yep. as well. I, I think the thing is, you know, with, with Gladys, it's the suffering. It is that mm-hmm. idea of the cat playing with its prey. Um, that the, there's just take the bite out of the neck and stop the suffering. She, yep. You know, in that moment where she kills herself, you, I mean, you absolutely go, she's removing her own suffering. And, and it, it's that cut back to the blood trickling down you know the face um of the distant emotionless doll's face mm-hmm. of gladys yeah. um is just really a very very powerful image Certainly. um and it 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 well deserves its moment in the annals of any good horror mm-hmm. film or tv show yep. uh, this this whole harrowing of gladys murray yeah well, you know, that, yeah, it's certainly one of the most standout moments of Penny Dreadful as well. Uh, one of those, one of those moments that you remember from uh, the first time you watched it as well. Uh, probably didn't do much for your phobia of dolls, though, John, did it? Not at all. Um, for me, dolls are a big no-no. Only cuddly toys uh, for me. Certainly <laughs> none of these porcelain-like dolls uh, or puppets. Um, I will never be going to a Punch and Judy show ever <laughs> never, again. Never again. Uh, probably not going to be watching Child's Play, the television show either. No. <laughs> a pediophobia is the fear of dolls, John. Well, then I certainly have that along <laughs> with my arachnophobia. There you go. Excellent, excellent. No dolls covered in spiders for you. No, uh, I, and weirdly, whilst I really don't like spiders, I certainly... Uh, like them in the sense that I know, you know, they catch flies yes. and all that. So, yes, I like spiders for that. But yes, um, the idea of being bitten. Certainly, uh, currently outside the back of our house, we mm. probably have an infestation of <laughs> uh, false widow spiders, uh, which is just like, eek. They're grand. They're grand. Try and live over in Australia with Ray uh, and see how much he has to put up with uh, with the spiders over there. Uh, any notes for this episode of uh, of Penny Dreadful, episode five, season two, John? Yes. Um, it is something that we didn't really talk about when uh, Caliban renamed himself John Clare, <laughs> but just to take a line from Vanessa to uh, John Clare, mm-hmm. uh, you share your name with a dead poet. How did we not? <laughs> exactly. So, I, I, you know, I have to say, Ray was also there. All three of us seem to miss <laughs> no. this. I think it's just because of the trepidation or the, the, the way that he delivers the name when he's asked it, um, when he's asked to provide a name. He goes, uh, John... Um, um, Claire, you know, if he'd gone William uh, Wordsworth, we probably would have gotten <laughs> named after yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. But it's just because it's two reasonably uh, normal names that he that he has. It looks like he's chosen the two of them separately. We should have guessed, though, shouldn't we? We should have. Um, but very interesting. So I had a look. Um, I looked up John Clare uh, because Caliban or John Clare is well. Um, this that, this could now get confusing. So <laughs> Caliban. As John Clare right. in the show, he goes, he was small and he shared an empathy with creatures and animals, mm-hmm. um, which was kind of interesting because what I found out was that he was an English poet and he became known for his celebrations or sorrows of the English countryside, uh, the plants, the animals, the people that lived within it mm-hmm. in terms of the celebrations of country life, but also the loss or the sorrow of the destruction of the countryside ah, as right, well. Yeah. In the sense, not only about the Industrial Revolution, but even the Agricultural Revolution, where you had the privatization of huge swaths of, of common land uh, uh, as well yes, into, yeah. um, you know, 
private farms or farms owned by the landed gentry and mm-hmm. and and worker farmers um so it, it's really quite interesting but in addition to that as well um of what was described as a poet of the alienated and unstable self oh, okay. um as well so you know Caliban here is alienated and mm-hmm. um, Vanessa is or has been in the past portrayed as being unstable uh, by the medical class exactly. um, within the Victorian era. Um, and in fact, John Clare did die in a lunatic asylum. So he probably did have some form of mental illness or maybe he just wasn't understood by the medical profession uh, of his time. But um, so it's kind of interesting little parallels there, but his biographer described him as arguably the greatest labouring class poet that England had ever produced, or at least of the 19th century. Right. right. Um, in the sense that he came from a working class family. Mm-hmm. His poetry was about working class, the labouring class, not about the kings, queens, and so on. It, and it was about people um, in, in the countryside and about individuals. So, it's, that's kind of interesting. I, I like that notion for me personally. Right. That makes up for us not knowing who he was last time and not checking it up before we uh, went on to record. So uh, yeah. very good job. Very good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, just a quick note from me um, about Hecate, um, the character that's been introduced this season, the daughter of Evelyn Poole, maybe. Um, that's just a, just a reference to the fact of her name. You know, it's a, it is a very unusual name. I think we'll talk about the scene where she... Uh, is questioned about how unusual her name is. Um, but Hecate was the Greek goddess of magic, uh, witchcraft, the night, moon, ghosts, and necromancy. So there's a very good reason why they've chosen this name for the daughter of Evelyn Poole. Yeah, here, nice nice, uh, nice stuff there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have one other note as well, mm-hmm. is in the, the continuing deciphering of the Verbus Diablo puzzle, we do get reference to Lupus Day or the Hound of God. Yes, we do. And of course, we do know one of the uh, characters in this show does like to cock his leg every so often, <laughs> uh, Ethan Chandler. Is it Remus Lupin from Harry Potter? No. <laughs> no. No, it's not. <laughs> Good old Ethan. So is he um, this totem of the Lupus Day mm. being referred to in the written form? form of verbus diablo yes he probably he probably is (laughs) probably exactly Uh, since there's only two of us for this episode there's definitely uh, would have been other points that we talk about just one that i want to just highlight because i thought it was really interesting was just the moment where ethan's recounting the siege maneuver that he'd done when he was in the army saying that he's the type of person that knows exactly how to get rid of an enemy surround them in one location and kill every single one one of them until they cease to exist is how he describes it and then he says in order to banish these nightcomers, in order to get rid of these nightcomers, they need to use every single thing they have available to them, every weapon, every ritual, every superstition, and we will defend our cliff, is the way that yeah, he's really described nice, it. Yeah. But the nightcomers are much more uh, conniving, much more cunning than Ethan has, uh, even Ethan thinks. He thinks there's just going to be a front, a full uh, frontal assault on the house. He thinks, you know, they're going to come back in through the door and there's going to be a massive fight. So we see each member of the team kind of going through their superstitions their rituals their weapons um, which i just i like the kind of lining up of all of this we have vanessa drawing her serpent on the new doors we have uh, ethan uh, doing the smoke ritual which is uh, the indian ritual that he's yeah. doing around the house and then he goes up to his bed and and does his prayers at bedtime you know which does belie the fact that he said in the past he doesn't believe in god yet here he is by his bedside praying to God, just like a normal Christian would do, sitting beside the bed praying. We also have Sam Bene hanging the dolls around the house. And of course, Sir Malcolm being the hunter, he's the one that gets all of his guns together around the house, which is which is really interesting. And then finally, we have Mr. Lyle, a, a newer member of the company, uh, going downstairs into the basement, hiding the fact, it seems, uh, of his Jewish heritage and going up to, and doing a Jewish prayer, a Jewish traditional yeah. uh, prayer downstairs in the basement, which I just thought it was quite an interesting little nod. You know, there's no, there was no uh, reference to this in the past about him feeling persecuted for his Jewish heritage, but it's interesting that he would uh, take that moment to be away from everybody else to perform his ritual no exactly and, and deal with uh, with his own i suppose superstitions i thought that weapons. was an interesting little moment of, of the show given the you know jewish pogroms um against the jews uh, by christians it has 
has happened through from um, medieval times mm-hmm. all the way through, you know, as this scapegoat and then into the 20th century mm-hmm. uh of a of a secular nature through um you know specifically with the holocaust and so on that you know there was this element of uh keeping that faith quiet even though there were synagogues yeah. uh, and long standing synagogues um that go back to the victorian period mm-hmm. um so it, it's a really interesting beat in in the commentary of yeah. being a jew um sort of within a christian society potentially and i think and it's um, just a beat as, as well yeah I, exactly I, again i love how it's referred to by uh by ethan just saying every weapon every ritual every superstition you know it, it's it doesn't matter what it is you believe in all of us believe in something we're going to use the power of all of that versus the nightcomers that was a, a really interesting scene um that's it for the notes on the, on episode five i'm going to take a little break and we'll be back with our discussion about episode six of season two glorious horrors Hi, I'm one of the High Priests of Conchu Ray, and I have the sacred privilege of providing you, the loony listener, with a podcast honouring Marvel's very own Moon Knight. So join me and a host of others at Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, or support the show by becoming a Patreon member. Into the Night, a Moon Knight podcast. It's time to get your Conchu on. Welcome back, Penny Faithful. We're talking about Season 2, Episode 6 of Penny Dreadful, Glorious Horrors. I'm one of your hosts again, Derek. Hello there, fellow Glorious Horrors. Uh, (laughs) Yes, I am one of your other hosts, John. Welcome back to this Episode 6 of Penny Dreadful. Yeah, the morning after episode, I think we'll call it. Yes, this is most definitely (laughs) a post-coital morning after. Mm -hmm. We have breakfast blood and blusher um, yes lily cooking up a breakfast for old victor um a bit of blood and dare i say it a disturbing haircut from evelyn on some alchem mm-hmm. and angelique applying blusher and um foundation uh, to set herself up for the day she has been renewed and invigorated with the supportive words of dorian mm. and of course a good old session at night definitely yes absolutely let's get into our discussion about this episode as always going to do short discussions about these episodes of penny dreadful uh, so episode six of penny dreadful season two is directed by james hawes this is the final episode that james directed for penny dreadful what a way to go out uh, in this episode really um recently he's directed three episodes of the tv show snowpiercer which is finally coming out in May of this year, uh, a show that uh, was originally delayed. It was uh, created about three years ago, I think. Uh, they started filming the first season and then it got renewed for a second season, moved networks, uh, got uh, got held back for the second season and for some reshoots. So uh, that show is eventually coming out this year. But really excited to see what the final product is, especially if James Halls is involved. Yes, the director. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the episode was written once again by showrunner John Logan. Are you bored of me saying that yet? No, no, it's it's good. It's good because, you know, just to the idea that this is in many respects um, a singular vision, Mm -hmm. um, I think is quite important. I I do know other writers do come on board for season three, but certainly, you know, it's an interesting uh, element here, a bit like with Watchmen, a series that we covered were Damon Lindelof, even though there was a writer's room, you know, he very much was involved in every episode mm-hmm. um, in terms of the 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 script for the TV show. Yeah. But it's um, not very often we get a show that, that has just one run, one writer that, that takes on board the entire show. Uh, so it's quite interesting seeing this one person's vision uh, being put on screen. Uh, and again, he's going to be back for uh, Penny Dreadful yeah. City of Angels. I mean, you do wonder whether he had a writing room himself, mm. um, at least to bounce the ideas off or just, you know, surely there was uh, some group of people um, that he bounced the ideas off yeah. uh, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the summary for this episode of Penny Dreadful Season 2, Episode 6, Glorious Horrors? Sure. After spending the night with Madame Carly, Sir Malcolm returns home to learn that his wife has taken her own life. His reaction, however, is not what you would expect. Mm -mm. Everyone agrees that he is acting strangely and clearly is not himself. 
Ethan gets a visit from the sole survivor of the attack at the Mariner's Inn, who makes it clear that he will not give up and will continue to pursue him. Meanwhile, Dorian Gray throws a ball, a coming out party for Angelique, and invites Vanessa and Victor Frankenstein. Lily attends as well and is the belle of the ball, drawing a good deal of attention from Dorian, which upsets both Angelique and Victor. Mm -hmm. Vanessa attends alone, but has an encounter, real or imagined, with Mrs. Poole's daughters. Meanwhile, Ethan, who declined attending the ball with Vanessa, turns to Sembene to help him with what will happen that evening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Full moon time. It is. (laughs) Ho! <laughs> yes, we don't actually get uh, much howling at the moon from uh, from Ethan, but we do get uh, his transformation in this episode once again. They do a great job. I think I mentioned back at the end of season one, the idea of keeping back him as a werewolf and then just revealing it for a very quick moment uh, was a really good choice. And in this episode particularly, once again... We have some fantastic makeup uh, for the character and, and for the creation of the wolf inside Ethan. And they do a great job of lighting it and positioning uh, this creature so that it doesn't look out of place in this world, I suppose. Um, it can happen. I think my joke uh, back at the time was it could come off a little bit teen wolf if you do it the wrong way. So yeah. they have certainly done it the right way. And there's a great moment that we'll talk about next episode. Uh, but for this episode, John, what's your big moment for season two, episode six? Not another bloody ball. <laughs> no, um, very it, bloody ball, it yeah. is a very bloody ball. It is, um, it's the ball, mm-hmm. um, for sure. I absolutely love this. Um, and dare I say it, I love a good Victorian ball. Um, it's only in watching this that I, uh, came to understand that because I, I absolutely love the, a similar ball and social gathering in an ideal husband uh, the oh, yeah. movie yeah. again based off a um a play by Oscar Wilde mm-hmm. um so a nice little connection here for for, for, for me uh, for sure um, <laughs> and Dorian course, and it was yeah. yes and the writer of the book Dorian Gray yeah. and yeah a, a huge literary giant uh, in this Victorian period mm-hmm. but uh, yeah I came to understand that I I love the idea of this ball this social gathering as a vehicle for social interaction and mm-hmm. observation of, of people. Uh, I think Mr. Lyle talks about the rules of the game, and uh, that's what is so um, great about these Victorian balls, is that there is um, a decadence to it, yet they're also moral uh, and uh, about it. And, and there are, yeah. the, the, you know, it, it's the social standing, it's the social networking, uh, but it, it, it's also really well uh, observed. And I just think it was uh, fantastic. Um, you know, there are many great interactions in uh, these scenes at Dorian Gray's home, uh, for sure, mm-hmm. but between with and sort of all predicated on the entrance you know um to begin with of dorian and angelique mm-hmm. there is miss pool or evelyn pool's daughter hecate yeah. as well victor and lily arriving vanessa arriving alone uh, which is in a sense its own statement as she's not with a male escort mm-hmm. uh, and then the the reveal of malcolm and evelyn as uh, a couple uh, and so soon after his mm-hmm. wife's death a de-bearded malcolm as well a, yes indeed <laughs> a, a, a a smooth as a baby bottom mm-hmm. uh, sir malcolm here yes. But uh, one that I really want to pick up on is just um, is Mr. Lyle with with Miss Poole here. Um, you know, they really don't like one another. And I think okay. that's the other element of the, the observation here and um, that it's all smiles, bright eyes, this outward appearance of of knowing one another. But when they, they don't, the, it, it's the quips that they make, the, the sleight of hand that they do, uh, where Mr. Lyle talks about, you know, being schooled in the social graces. Mm-hmm. And uh, Hecate goes, what social graces? Such as mendacity and betrayal, you know, as, as a slight towards Mr. Lyle. Mm-hmm. Um, and he goes, I don't know what games you're playing, 
thing, but watching your scales catch the light as you coil um, <laughs> is something that he he really likes. And yeah. I just love this tone, you know. Uh, I think, though, we do learn here a bit more that she has a game that she's playing herself mm-hmm. uh, and that maybe one that her own mother, Evelyn Poole, is unaware of. Um, so I, I, I really like this, uh, the idea that um, the the queen of the coven, Evelyn Poole, has her enemies from her own daughters Absolutely. here. But I think also with Hecate and Mr. Lyle, what we have is uh, this this centering around Vanessa, mm-hmm. where Mr. Lyle um, is actually really uh, quite protective uh, of her yeah and so. uh i i really kind of like that you know he talks about the dizzying panorama and vanessa says all the toys in the box scattered around the the floor but he says i must escort you home you know there are too many complications here mm-hmm. you're not safe and you don't know the rules yeah and, and like we- echo- echoing what vanessa said to him about uh her not having a love life effectively saying that she thinks she knows the rules but doesn't want to play the game anymore and that's effectively how lyle talks her out of leaving you know he's not only yeah yeah, exactly he's not only protective of her remember it's also possibly he feels like it will be her fault if anything happens to her so he's he's also uh wants to do whatever he can to help save her because he doesn't want her to be in this situation possibly caused by himself so uh, he is he is very protective of her but he doesn't want it to be his fault. No, know, so, e- exactly. Um, so um, he, he can see the growing danger within this uh, within this ballroom before anybody else can, because he knows having these four people in the room, uh, Hecate and and her fellow witches, along with uh, Evelyn Poole, all being in the same place, along with Vanessa, is not a good place to be. Absolutely, and and it leads to this wonderful moment of the the, the masses dancing mm. as. Um, Hecate with her two sisters advancing towards Vanessa as Vanessa starts to get kind of disorientated hearing uh, murmurings and voices Mm -hmm. uh, around the room she understands um, that there is something there even as Malcolm and Evelyn walk in she senses this person entering into the room maybe it is to do with sensing um her past as well yeah, uh, yeah. up on uh, Ballantry Moor with Joan Clayton yeah, yeah. and I, I thought that was really nice the ringing in her ears isn't it, as uh, as Ex- the arrival of Evelyn and she doesn't know what that's a, why that's affecting her basically but um it, it's almost like a mask that's in front of her she can't recognize madame Kelly. remember she only saw her once at the at the seance um, but she has heard of the relationship brewing between uh, malcolm and, and uh, evelyn Poole. um but it's like a mask and then eventually it's lifted as that ringing goes she goes of course i remember you right fine i, I do know who you are but it's almost as if there's been some kind of convincing maybe from Evelyn Poole to trust her within that uh, within that ringing in her ears. I don't know whether it's some form of control that's emanating from from Evelyn at that point, but they do have a great, again, another great tete-a-tete between the two yeah, of them. Yeah, it's a discuss. lovely pointed conversation mm-hmm. between the two of them. As John Logan is so good at writing, yes. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, you have the Vanessa saying, he talks about you so often, and Evelyn turns around and says, and yet he talks of you so so infrequently. <laughs> um, just really, really nice. Yeah. Um, I look at you as a ward. Uh, yeah, <laughs> as, exactly. As Vanessa goes, no, no, I'm more of a friend. Um, you know, uh, and then they talk about the approval. You know, maybe you should come over and visit. And I, I you know, um, I, I do feel your approval is what I want. Kind of thing. No, everyone, ab- but, absolutely. Um, very it, pointed. Yeah. It is. It's it's such a great uh, conversation here. But ultimately, with. Um, mo- moving back to where she's at the the front of the the hall where the the string quartet are are mm-hmm. playing as the witches advance, and then you get the blood raining from above. Um, mm-hmm. It is so good, uh, and I certainly wasn't expecting that. You know, it, it's this idea of um, her being spellbound. I felt and yeah. um, by the advancing witches, I just loved how they pass through the dancers. At least um, Hecate in the middle. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that was just so nicely done it's you know like they've got the ebb and the flow of an ocean uh, as they're as the exactly. dancers are passing yeah. you know you know the band playing on and the dancers still dancing while this 
blood is falling. Like I have to say, you know, filming of that scene must have been so interesting to try and get everybody to ignore the blood that's falling all over your face. It might be going in your eyes. You see people covered head to toe. I think Malcolm particularly yeah. and Evelyn are covered head to toe in what looks like buckets of blood, like, you know, yeah, Tyler Andronicus levels of blood yeah. in this scene. But to have all of these extras and all of these people here continuing about their movements for that couple of minutes uh, while Vanessa is seeing this the blood falling everywhere onto the paintings and everything in the room. Also, the poor set designer must have been <laughs> yeah, kind of going, exactly. right, this has to be the final scene that we shoot in this room because everything's going to be destroyed after it. You know? Well, that's it. it, it <laughs> and the costumes mm-hmm. and all of that, certainly. I mean, I was trying to wonder what the blood signifies. Is it the blood of the people um, killed by this coven of witches in, in pursuit of it? Is it just symbolic of... Um, the the death, uh, the evil of the witches mm-hmm. and their master, yeah. more importantly. So I, I thought it was uh, really nicely done. I did think um, it was uh, also maybe it's the precursor to It's Raining Men done <laughs> by um, the string quartet of uh, 18... 18- 95 but instead it's it's raining blood i like it. um I like yes it. i thought so uh, i wonder how far it got up the charts uh introducing string quartet with it's raining it's blood, raining blood like on it. top of the gramophone <laughs> you know i yeah. thought that was really it, it but it was this whole ball um was just a great microcosm of mm-hmm the society and of all these characters. And I, I thought it was really, really well done. And of course, what I thought was quite nice was that the grand ballroom, you know, with light, with people, with conversation, and it, it was being intercut with the cellar at um, St. Malcolm's, you know, with the, 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 the lowly, dark, damp cellar, mm-hmm. you know, invoking when... Um, Mr. Fenton, op, played by Ollie Alexander, was tied up there with that the, the darkness and and the moonlight. You know, yeah. as uh, Ethan is asking Sam Bene to sort of watch over him. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, also intriguing, obviously, for that room. You know, itself, we've seen that room multiple times in this show. We've seen Dorian Gray holding court there, and the first time we were introduced to him was the orgy that was going on around him and he looked totally bored by it. We've seen it when Vanessa visited the first time and of course we saw it when Brona came to have her uh, pornographic photo shoot in that very same room. Uh, it looks vastly different when the doors are opened and there's a massive ball going on in the centre of that room. You know, we, we even hear Dorian kind of mentioning to uh, to Vanessa, do you like the room the way it is? You know, so it's the same room that we've seen multiple times in the show but this time being used as this massive ballroom. So much other stuff is going on in the scene that the reveal of Angelique to uh, to everybody in high society as Dorian's new partner is is a massive moment really for the two of them as they walk into the center of the room and and dance um but it turns shady pretty quickly it turns bad pretty quickly absolutely you know? we, we referenced it in the previous episode now that he has accomplished this goal of revealing Angelique to society is he now moving on to his next conquest we have him dancing with Lily an interesting interaction between the two of them. Dorian plays this really interestingly, even for the audience, because you're going, does he know that Lily is Brona? Because he had quite a significant moment with her and had a photograph yeah. taken of her. Or, like, does he think she's playing some kind of game uh, with him, pretending to be this type of person fitting in? And is he kind of going, well, I also do that, so I applaud you for this. May I compliment you on your eyes? Or does he not recognize her at all because he's had so many conquests and so many moments in his life that everybody else would be changed by and he may not be changed by it because the way he plays it is so interesting. He uh, he has this fascination with who this character of Lily is and Victor's doing a really bad job of covering up who her, what her past is, but he's just intrigued by who this person is that that's walked into his life. Yeah. Um, so I, I couldn't get from the episode and even from episode seven, which we'll be talking about next time, um, even from episode seven, I couldn't get whether he knows that Lily is Brona and knows something has happened to her. Is it because they're kindred spirits in being supernatural or preternatural as they, as the two of them are? Yeah. Like um, he has with Vanessa, you know, mm-hmm. that, that kind of, but it, I, I think, you know, he certainly takes an interest. She grabs his attention. I, I did have, it's a new distraction, mm-hmm. but I, I think whether it is because that, that distraction is because 
he knows he's met her before and just because of how she's behaving uh, as high society and mm-hmm. um, that that intrigues him or whether you know he talks about um the echoes of the past because your hands are cold that like the touch of marble mm-hmm. that yeah as you say then he feels there's something different about her yeah. uh, i i thought it was really nice but i think that is the essence of dorian he is distracted there is some new point of interest here and i i do like the way that it, it it's you know you see the the jealousy coming on angelique's face with the attention paid to lily yeah. especially you know he he thinks it's just a passing moment where dorian raises a toast to his, his beautiful angelique and then and especially a, a, a welcome to um Lily, oh yes, uh, Lily Frankenstein, yeah. and you know you, you felt s- that I, fe- I felt that moment you, when uh, when you have Angelique, who is supposed to be the center of this ball, yeah. giving a minor toast, saying congratulations, but also a massively special yeah. welcome well, to that's you, it. Lily. You know? Dorian trumps his own effusive sort of um, spotlight on Angelique by by ramping it up for lily and you know that awkward moment with victor vanessa lily dorian uh, and angelique being there together you really sense it and um, there is this great moment where i think victor and angelique are left on the sidelines to drink or the mm-hmm. non for victor uh, and you just see angelique kind of taking a very large swig Gold. of the <laughs> the champagne uh, as she realizes that something is happening here mm-hmm. Uh, that she is no longer the central focus for yeah. for Dorian. So it's great social observation. I really, really enjoyed this um, a, a lot. I think also just quickly coming back to Mr. Lyle and his protection for Vanessa, I think what's interesting about it, you know, I do think Mr. Lyle is playing both sides here because mm-hmm. we have a great um, moment between Mr. Lyle and Evelyn Poole at her home uh, at the Witch's Coven, talking about beauty uh, and Mr. Lyle chips in with and youth. Um, and it's a great moment from Helen McCory here as she relates to beauty uh, and how uh, in the Renaissance uh, in in Venice they would add belladonna a poison that would dilate the the pupils of the eye to simulate excitement uh, and what a s- sad way that this beauty each time to to get the effect you had to add more slowly poisoning uh, yourself and she goes what we won't do for beauty and as I say Mr. Loud chips in with youth um, and you get a really sad, melancholic sort of introspection from Helen Macquarie here, where her youth is granted because it takes more than a drop of poison. It takes everything. Yeah. Um, such a sad prize, such a price we have to pay. Mm-hmm. Um, and she just has this moment of, I didn't turn from God, he turned from me. This seems like a curse in itself for her, yeah. uh, but something that she does because it is for the master and the master must be served, mm-hmm. must be obeyed uh, and must be uh, fawned upon at all this time. And yeah. You have this um, conversation between these two, uh, Mr. Lyle and Mrs. Poole. Mm-hmm. And it's just so, so good. Um, but again, Mr. Lyle is in her presence and and then is protecting Vanessa yeah. in in the ballroom Absolutely. or trying to. So I, I I like his duplicity here, Mr. Lau, because mm. it's still not fully known, but he's certainly maintaining the relationship with the coven whilst probably um, undermining them with the company. Exactly. I think he's using the knowledge that he has to help save the company. And that conversation he has with Evelyn Poole is echoed in the conversation he has with Hecate later on, where she's talking about her plans and saying, um, I'm very young. And Lyle responds with Evelyn, and so is she. She is as young as you are. And her response, Hecate's response to that is, for now. Um, I I had a a little touch of uh, Neil Gaiman's um, Stardust, the witches within that who are consuming the heart of stars to keep themselves youthful, and they all fight amongst themselves as to who is going to get the largest part of the heart to keep themselves young. And that's what this almost feels like with Hecate battling with her mother as to which one of them will remain youthful for the longest is what it feels like. So while Hecate looks like she's a young lady of, you know, mid-twenties kind of age, maybe even younger than that, 
And while Evelyn Poole looks like a lady in her 40s or, or early 50s kind of age group, we've talked before about references to uh, Evelyn Poole being eons old, as she described herself. Uh, Hecate most likely is hundreds of years old as well. But the two of them looking youthful is most likely to do with a lot of the rituals that they've been doing in in the coven. So uh, so I do like this kind of battle, this idea of, you know, a girl being treated like a child by her mother, the leader of the coven, yeah. saying, I will rise and I will take my rightful place as leader of this coven at some point. So again, another little barbing of these of these conversations which is always good in this show while the ball is such a central part of this episode there's just some interesting stuff going on with ethan's storyline in this in this episode uh, we're on episode six of the show now in, in season two so uh, as the storyline of the werewolf rises within ethan i think it's good that there's some really interesting interactions for him uh, going on as well you know we have the conversation that goes on between Inspector Rusk and Ethan at the Waxwork Museum, which I just think is fabulous. Yeah, it's really good. Um, this really interesting concept where Rusk is saying, well, the reason why I'm visiting is because that old adage of the murderer returns to the scene of his crime. Well, he may not return to the actual scene, but he may return right here. Isn't that right, Ethan? You know? Yeah, really <laughs> pointedly. So, so good, because we have the conversation in the previous episode where he knows that Ethan is involved. Somehow he may not know that there's some supernatural element with inside Ethan that that drove him to kill everybody but he thinks he's the one that murdered everybody in this situation. Absolutely. I mean he um, actually you know it, it is that moment where he leans in to say I know you're involved I will find proof. Mm-hmm. Um, he is looking for that proof and he he has his target um, and, and you know he follows that up with better a quick hanging than the slow torture of guilt. Exactly. What a great line that is from Inspector Rusk. Yeah. Uh, I really really enjoy uh that uh, as well i think it's good that the putney's house of wax is um featuring so Mm -hmm. so much here it's also just a a note quickly because i i think how they're using putney's uh waxwork um is being used to underline uh, different points in in this show between Mm -hmm. the characters and i think here um, between Inspector Rusk and, and, and Ethan. It's really, really nicely done. I mean, we had it in the previous episode where he, he's called into Inspector Rusk's uh, office as well, where they have very much uh, a pointed conversation again. Mm-hmm. And certainly Inspector Rusk does like to use his time in the Transvaal and, um, and during the Boer War, um, as a, point of reference for how he approaches things Uh, in the previous episode it was with the loss of his arm where he says just to complete that story i had to go and find my arm in in a room filled with other arms Mm -hmm. just to see it and then i just tossed it back on the pile i had to have closure in the story exactly Uh, he's the kind of guy that will investigate forever Uh, but the pressure still builds up throughout this episode for ethan because we have roper the pinkerton the person that inspector rusk has been trying to get the information out of for that attack on mariners in we see him arriving calling into the house i suppose i think at the end of episode five we saw that he was watching sir malcolm's house from outside this time he actually rings the doorbell and comes in and has another very pointed conversation with ethan now the only only thing that stood out to me with this is the threats from Mr. Roper, given everything that Ethan has gone through, that this guy calls himself the devil and this guy says, you know, I can make it in through the windows of your house to kill any anybody that you love effectively. I'm not too sure whether that would work on Ethan. Remember what he's seen, you know, he's had he's had the vampires in season one where he's seen actual nests full of vampires that are willing to rip out your throat and kill you he's had the visit from the nightcomers into his house he's had the devil possessing vanessa before and this man who is effectively just a policeman from the, from america or a private investigator i suppose from america coming over threatening him this way i'm not too sure whether that threat really works on ethan at all you know um and i think he's kind of trying to say to him in a moment where you're not watching if you don't do what i say i'll find you But Ethan's always watching, and so is everybody else in that house, always watching out for danger. That's that's true, but I think the threat against Vanessa, where he calls out her Mm -hmm. bedroom, uh, is one that Ethan does take on board. I also just wondered whether it was Mr. Roper really kind of saying... I know what I saw, but I also know that you are a man yeah. and you can be killed with 
simply a gun. Exactly. You know, yeah. that, um, you, you may have this supernatural, um, be possessed with this supernatural ability, uh, with this, m- uh, magical ability. However, during the day, you are simply a man, yeah. uh, of which, bullets of any type not simply a silver bullet Mm -hmm. uh, can be used to take you down although that is an interesting test that needs to be done (laughs) Um, does it still require a silver bullet when he's in the form of 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 a man maybe uh, which is kind of interesting um I, I I think Mr. Roper's makeup here, uh, you know, is just really nicely done. It, it's you know, how do you put this across that his face has been torn mm-hmm. away, um, and you know, the mask, the leather mask, this kind of rudimentary, probably high tech for its time to to um, sort of cover the scarring, but probably also to help uh, it to heal better. Yeah. Um, they, they look like they've put in false teeth to give him so this overbite that goes to the side of where he's had the the wounds and the 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 most attack uh, yeah. on on the uh, I think the right side of his face mm-hmm. um, and just that bloody eye you know so in, in his own way he looks freakish and supernatural mm. um, and I I kind of really like that makeup yeah there's even the comment from him where he says I was smiling at that thing it's very difficult for me to tell whether I'm emoting properly under this quarter inch thick of leather mask that I have to get used to wearing now you know it's a very uh, very conscious point from mr roper that look what you did to me i will do far worse to you unless you follow my direction so it does seem in here that ethan is making the decision to get out of london uh, once again we started the season with him saying he was going to go on the run into into europe to get away from everything that he's done um but six episodes into the season here we're getting these threats that feel like he may follow the directions from roper in here i just wondered if his threats would roll off ethan's back like water off a duck's back you know yeah well <laughs> Cause, absolutely because there's you know the actual devil has been in his home before yes. yeah. <laughs> don't say i'm a devil i can get in through the window he's seen that um but then it, the the story culminates i think you mentioned it already really the major points of uh, of what happens with within the cellar uh ethan bringing in Simbene into his true nature i suppose because nobody else knows about this nobody else within that household knows that this happens to ethan that he becomes a werewolf every full moon um i did like i didn't notice it the first time i watched the episode but i did notice the second time um i did like the idea that vanessa asks ethan to come to the ball on friday night and he goes oh sugar what day's friday oh that's full moon night can't do it that night got other plans (laughs) which i just thought was interesting because he looks like he's really letting her down you know you mentioned how I suppose how much it would have stood out that Vanessa arrived on her own without any escort at all. And the reason she did is because Ethan has to take care of his, uh, his supernatural, um, possession once a month, effectively. Yeah. So. I find it really interesting. He brings Sembene mm-hmm. in, in the moment of episode six. Absolutely. They're going, I hope he's put that chair far enough back. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. I hope the, the chains and the bindings hold. Um, I thought it was really nicely reminiscent of Mr. Fenton, as I was saying, mm-hmm. uh, with, with the, the moonlight coming through. Absolutely. Um, and I do like the change where you see kind of the bones cracking in his hand mm-hmm. as they, they turn more lupine, I suppose. Yes. I would um, want to have had a bit more instruction if I was some Benny. Definitely. Come down here, sit in this chair, chain me up to the wall. Don't move the chair a couple of inches forward. <laughs> you know, you leave it there. Yeah. If you want to move a couple of inches back, you're welcome. Um, and you, know, you must stay and well, you sit must stay there. and watch and see what happens. I suppose, you know, there is the argument that um, Ethan doesn't know exactly what happens. He doesn't have much memory of the things that he's done. He knows when he wakes up covered in blood and he knows something terrifying and terrible is happening to him but um he knows that he's probably a werewolf but doesn't know what it looks like to other people and doesn't know how vicious he can get i yeah. suppose so maybe that's the reason why i didn't explain it to uh to some with a few more words but come downstairs sit in that chair while i'm chained to the wall and watch me all night not enough for me. I would need a little bit more. <laughs> well, as he lunges at Sembeni, oh, Sembeni wow. doesn't stay on the chair yeah. and is there with his fists up. And mm. I'm not entirely sure that a boxing stance <laughs> would be uh, adequate protection yes. against uh, this werewolf. Uh, but certainly I think, um, you know, it goes nicely into episode seven. Mm. And I think it's nice that it's Ethan who trusts 
uh, and tells Sembene, uh, given their own relationship, you know, I think Ethan connects in with Sembene around the Native American Indians and, and the the spiritual um, culture of yeah. the uh, Native American Indians uh, in the same way. Uh, and that grounding with the environment, with the earth, that I think uh, we're assuming here that Sembene's African tribes as well also have as well that mm. that closeness to um their their landscape their environment yeah. and the the spiritual plane connected in with animals uh and plants yeah. rather than um the machines that we see in the industrial revolution and, yeah, and science so I, I think that's a real nice connection here it although is. of all the secrets to be told um you kind of go, oh, that's great. Yeah, I'll do that. But then for it to be that, I, you know, I think soiled knickers have been mentioned previously <laughs> and all are to be mentioned, yeah. um, in the, the, this set of, of episodes. Well, I am sure Sembene, well, certainly if I was in Sembene's uh, shoes, uh, soiled knickers would be, um, <laughs> certainly something that would be happening to me. Yes, definitely, definitely. Hopefully we'll get a bit more detail behind Sembene himself as to, uh, his background and his history. Another character we don't know much about, but I love his, uh, static or nature or stoicism uh, as he deals with everything yeah. that's going on. He's very, uh, he's very, uh, good at dealing with problems and situations, isn't he? Uh, I think that's a good place to leave our discussion about episode six. Any notes that we haven't talked about in the episode, John? Just to say that we do get a fetish of Sir Malcolm, mm -hmm. which is made by uh, Evelyn Poole. She takes a locket of her that she then attaches to this doll um, and uh, just starts the old chicken heart that she's taken presumably from another uh, poor, unfortunate toddler yeah. um, and gets that started up. Uh, and then she... Um, gives this fetish a good old kiss on the lips as well. Yeah. So, um, certainly here, um, you know, given what we saw, uh, with Gladys, you know, you do worry about Sir Malcolm, but Sorry. maybe it's to simply alter his personality, his character that we see in this with, uh, him being informed of, um, Gladys's death yeah. to be one that is very much um, sort of pro Evelyn Poole. It yeah. is to undermine the company, maybe. maybe. So it's not maybe a fetish designed with his death in mind, but mm. one uh, to make sure that he, without him knowing it, is powerless and is working for them yeah. uh, rather than for the company. Absolutely. I was wondering, given the accuracy of each of these fetishes, each of these dolls, uh, to the look of each of the, of the characters that they're supposed to be portraying, you know, I wondered whether the fetish would stop working now that Malcolm has shaved his beard, considering the fetish does have a beard and Malcolm doesn't anymore. <laughs> you know, I like, did wonder how that much myself. How do you need to change yeah. your, your look for it to stop working? Can yeah. you cut your hair off or dye it and suddenly it stops, stops I, its influence? <laughs> absolutely. I wondered that myself. As Evelyn said, I've banished the bear to the cave yeah. uh, and, brought the, the and brought out the cub. Exactly. Great. Really nice. Yeah. Uh, I think the only other note I have is just the opening. I just think this is a really great horror opening. Oh, yeah. Um, with the maid seeing Gladys's blood coming from underneath the door to mm -hmm. the master bedroom. Um, I think what is great here is that it does put away a lot of the tropes here. We still get that lovely bone chilling scream, but we do not get the crash of the tray. She puts the tray down, uh, to scream, which I think, um, you know, she, as a maid is always thinking of the fine bone china. Don't crack the, uh, china. Don't crack the china. It will come <laughs> from my wage. So I really like this uh, moment. I thought it was a, a great horror trope, but just that little touch of the maid placing the tray down mm -hmm. on the sideboard before she enters into the room um, was a nice touch. Absolutely. Well, I did criticize Ethan uh, when he was investigating the nightcomers uh, in the walls. He'd seen something out of the corner of his eye, was still carrying the coffee tray that he uh, obviously drops to the floor as he gets attacked. So uh, this is a maid. This is a person that knows her job and knows exactly what she should be doing if anything yes. scary might possibly happen. Don't break the china. Exactly. But I love that that just rolls straight into the opening credits. So it does feel like 
those episodes back in season one, the, the I think it was episode one and three that had the murders at the beginning of the episode leading into the uh, the opening credits. So this feels like that kind of horror moment as uh, as it starts off the episode as well. That's it for our discussions on Penny Dreadful season two, episode six. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back after that with our discussion about episode seven, Little Scorpion. I am Connor from the House of L. And I am Ray from the House of Zod. We are two of the many, many survivors of Krypton's destruction, and we have made our home in Australia, and dare I say have become Australians, for better or worse. But we have also decided to read Superman comics, read Superman books, watch Superman shows, cartoons, movies, basically everything Superman, and from an Australian perspective as well. Whether you're a seasoned fan, like me, or whether you are coming in fresh, wide-eyed and wanting to learn more like me, then this podcast is for you. Join us for our bi-weekly adventures available on all good podcast catches. So just search for Last Sons of Krypton, a Superman podcast. We'll be coming to you from Australia or some cosmic dimension, wherever we are, that week. Up, 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 up and, and away! away. Welcome back, fellow Penny faithful, to the final episode in part five of our discussion about season two of Penny Dreadful, episode seven, Little Scorpion. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow Darklings, or maybe even fellow Scorpions. Uh, I am one of your other hosts, John. Yes, coming back for Little Scorpion, episode seven of Penny Dreadful. Yes, three episodes of Penny Dreadful being covered in each of these parts now, from now on until the end of season three of Penny Dreadful. This episode, Little Scorpion, was directed by Brian Kirk. This is the second episode he did of Penny Dreadful, but he directs two more this season. Uh, recently directed the action movie 21 Bridges, starring Chadwick Boseman and Sienna Miller, John. Okay, good stuff. Yes, yeah. good old uh, Black Panther mm-hmm. there yeah. in uh, 21 Bridges. Didn't they have to really check to make sure that it was 21 Bridges mm-hmm. that... Uh, crossed over onto manhattan island i think it was something like there was 90 the original title for the movie was 19 bridges and they went oh hang on there's a few more than we thought (laughs) but once again the episode was written by john logan john do you want to tell us the summary for this episode with a huge thank you to imdb uh, for providing the summaries for us for each of these episodes sure with the light of day ethan returns to his normal self After Vanessa's experience at the ball, she and Ethan set out for the cut wife's cottage, hoping to find a better weapon to defend themselves. The moon is still full, however, and he teaches her how to shoot a gun for protection. They enjoy their time together, but a chance encounter with Sir Geoffrey Hawkes leads Vanessa to the dark side. Mm. In London, Victor and Ferdinand Lyle continue to decipher the devil's story. Meanwhile, Lily has a date with Dorian Gray, and they end up at Putney's Waxworks, where John Clare sees them together. Gray sends her home in a cab, but she stops at a pub. She accompanies the stranger to his home, where she shows a different side of herself. She certainly does. Really yeah. does, doesn't yeah. she? I'll definitely be talking about that at my point, but John, do you want to leave this off with yours? Yes, it is the Book of the Dead mm. and at the cut wife of Ballantry Moore's former cottage, or as we also know, at uh, Joan Clayton. Mm-hmm. Yes, this evil black magic. Um, you know, there is a sense here, uh, as Vanessa says, she is going to leave London. It isn't safe. Um, you know, she has this moment where, um, you were all there at the ball, yet the lion still haunted. Um, there's a really nice moment as well where Victor is like, you're not the kind of person, uh, who would would run away from this fight and mm-hmm. it's not it is to find another weapon or something to defend themselves or something to go on the offensive here and mm-hmm. um, and i suppose always in the back of my mind it, it was this book of the dead exactly and um, that was bequeathed to her by joan clayton before uh, she died along with the rest of, of the cottage here on yeah. ballantry moor yeah we had that question when we watched the episode as to whether the book ended off in her bag or not so nice to <laughs> nice to at least have the confirmation we knew it was coming back it was definitely that item that was mentioned that you knew was going to be coming back at a later stage 
stage, but the warning that was given to her by Joan Clayton that this should only be used when she was on her last legs at the moment before dying is the only time she should be using this. So don't know whether she's gone to her lowest point yet when beginning to use this book. So uh, intriguing how it's being used. It is. I mean, effectively, you know, she was warned that you use it when all options have been exhausted because you would be changed forever. Mm -hmm. And in this, she uses it um, against Sir Geoffrey. And it's interesting because um, at the same time as she uses it against uh, Sir Geoffrey, she is effectively setting uh, his own hounds, uh, the four dogs that he is feeding uh, on him, uh, to feed on him effectively. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, does she know that at the same time, Ethan is there and has gone to Sir Jeffrey's manor with a gun to shoot him? Um, so I'm wondering whether she is doing it to protect Ethan uh, from killing or whether she doesn't know this uh, and is taking it upon herself to um, get her revenge on Sir Jeffrey, yeah. given they have both her and Ethan, this encounter with uh, Sir Jeffrey. I do think he was as awful as ever uh, and you can see maybe why she does turn to this book for sure but Definitely. the 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 great thing that comes from from this is, in, in her use of the book is that how does it change her yeah. and we have this great moment with her uh, and Ethan where he calls her out as are you happy now being a murderess mm -hmm. um do you know what it is to walk around with someone's body tied around your neck mm -hmm. uh, it's not the first time uh, but you know the second the third or fourth you get numb to killing um you know he really is coming at it from both being in the American cavalry, fighting the Indian wars and all that killing, but also he knows of his transformation yeah. uh, as well. Absolutely. And the point that you're, you were asking the question earlier on, whether she's doing it to protect Ethan or not, because he was there to kill uh, Sir Joffrey. Um, He's, he's going there to protect her. He's had the discussion with her before that he doesn't want her to become a murderer, to, to reach out and take revenge on this person, Joffrey. So he's going there to murder him before she has to because murder doesn't sit as heavily on his soul as it would on an innocent like Vanessa striking out, I suppose. So uh, so that's the reason why he's there. Yes, uh, exactly. I don't think she knows that he's there, but there's only two of them in the house. He's gone out for a while with a gun. So uh, presumably she has a feeling that that's where he might be gone, but she wants to take her own revenge. And that's what's causing the blackness, I suppose, to come at her soul is because taking revenge to kill someone doesn't actually cure you of uh, of that person. It will only uh, lead to worse things is the, is the conversation they have. Exactly. Um, and I, I think that is the forewarning that uh, Joan Clayton tells um, to, to Vanessa is that yeah. you will be internally ir ir irrevocably changed, mm -hmm. you know, and, and speaking of souls, Ethan says, you'll never get your soul back. Welcome to the night, Vanessa. Yes. Uh, and I wonder if, you know, is this a fissure between these two? You know, we're talking about their, the love that they couldn't act on. Well, they almost do here. Mm -hmm. There, there is a moment of, um, of, of romance. Um, but they are ripped apart, um, mainly because, you know, Vanessa is, we cannot do this. Um, it's something that, they cannot do so yeah. um I, I i liked that element here as, as well that Absolutely. their relationship cannot be consummated yeah. um like, like vanessa calls out we are dangerous yes, together. I exactly think i think that's just a really interesting touch between the two of them that she knows the two of them being together could destroy the world effectively so and there is um, almost that godly lightning strike oh yes and um, you know that also stops them from going any further it's almost like because you know we have this great uh sort of connection back to um the continuing deciphering of the the verbis diablo mm -hmm. uh with with victor and, and, and mr lyle which is is really uh really good and Mr. Lyle talks about the, the dance of the hound and the scorpion forever mm -hmm. circling, uh, one another, endlessly circling one another, um, which is, is really good. And it, within this, um, verbis diablo, what is becoming repeated throughout these different relics is Lupus Day, the hound of God, mm -hmm. um, that, 
there is a, a an obsession, uh, a, a neurosis that has developed within the language because the lupus day is a threat to the devil. Yeah. And so with this lightning strike, it's that the scorpion and the, the hound can't conjoin together. They have to be separate. And it's almost like that it's the lightning strike from God mm -hmm. to, to prevent them because all of a sudden they're having to put out a massive fire. <laughs> yes. But in the rain, there's a, that, that's where they, uh, they get the kiss to each other just, uh, just after putting out the fire. But, uh, yeah, I love that that's kind of what indicates that to Vanessa, Maybe we're too dangerous here. You know, the, the lightning strike yeah. should have told us to stay clear of each other. But I suppose I like how they use the kind of tropes of the two of them being away together in this uh, in this far off cottage, living together, telling each other stories at night while they're smoking what definitely isn't just tobacco and um, telling their stories about how they grew up. You know, the unheroic story of um of Ethan soiling his own uh, britches because he's on a horse that's too high for him uh, at six years old. Uh, you know, I love those kind of discussions between the two of them. And then obviously uh, her teaching him how to dance. Um, you know, all of these moments which are supposed to lead you to believe that finally, if you've been shipping these two characters since season one <laughs> yeah, and thinking exactly. they're going to get together, well, no, they're definitely not. If they do, it could spell the end of the world. He is supposed to be her protector. He's supposed to be the hand of God that will protect the scorpion from the demon or the devil. So, uh, so I love how they how it's kind of played you know this eternal dance between the two of them yeah it's, it's really really good also have to call out that absolutely wonderful moment in this episode of the transformation of ethan into the into the werewolf um where he goes out into the and onto the moors um and you see the flock of sheep who you expect not just one of them uh, <laughs> will have been killed that night but the the sh lighting again the the scene where you have one of the uh, one of the lambs being taken out and the blood being spurted in the air across the full moon over the moors i think is just wonderful yes give this director the opportunity to do his version of sherlock holmes and the hand of the baskervilles i think that would well be, that's would it. be it's a great evoking of the hand of the baskervilles mm -hmm. I, i'm wondering as well with the with the the lambs whether there's a signifier to the lamb of god as well absolutely yeah, um, could be. you know the, the sacrificial lamb here um and certainly he sacrificing the lamb rather than Vanessa. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the fact that he's teaching her to shoot and a bit like um, Evelyn Poole, she seems to be a natural yes, at is. hitting the target, <laughs> uh, whatever I that may be. I don't know how be. that is. I've never picked up a gun before. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> every target perfectly. Um, and of course, the one of her fears are dolls. Um, so yes, that is possibly going to um, lead her into some trouble maybe later on in this series yeah. if she ever gets to the Coven's house. Yeah. Um, but she does describe them as those eyes staring at you, uh, which I completely agree, Vanessa. It is that. Um, and she she said, but I had to play with them because you would be seen as socially deviant if you weren't <laughs> playing with a doll. Um, and that at night she had to kind of knock them knock them over so that they weren't all just staring at you. Mm. So, yes, the, the trauma of dolls, yeah. the, these emotionless dead eyes staring at mm -hmm. you um is certainly something that is uh yeah can scar a child for Absolutely. sure if you think that john couldn't be in love with vanessa ives more uh, this is the episode that cemented their relationship i think <laughs> i'm scared of dolls too says john <laughs> i know exactly how you feel about that vanessa <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um so yeah I, I think a great moment here of them returning to uh, Ballantry Moor. It is a great touchback to episode three, Nightcomers, uh, seeing, uh, Vanessa's relationship with, uh, Joan Clayton. Um, I, I think it's, so it, it, it is nice with that. You know, things are seriously shaky at Sir Malcolm's, um, house that she needs to start to look for other ways for to protect this company i think it was interesting as well that it is sir malcolm to the point saying earlier that um the the prick on the back of his neck whether he is um influenced or more persuaded by evelyn Poole now oh, yes. so that she's kind of mesmerizing him to some extent yeah, yeah. he's the one that's really trying to prevent her from going away, yeah. you know, because Evelyn Paul desperately wants to capture Vanessa for her master. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it, it's, it's an interesting sort of uh, new take with, with Sir Malcolm since his 
official sort of engagement in that sense with Evelyn Poole and and with her various bits of magic to I think mesmerize him and I yeah. think that's why he's trying to stop her from going yeah very much so and I like that Vanessa gives that warning to everybody else just keep an eye on him you know she won't take Simbene with her uh, to this uh, property that she owns to Balanchy Moor um, because Simbene needs to be there to make sure that if anything happens with Malcolm He'll take care of it kind of thing. But we also have Victor left behind to watch over and just to make sure that nothing bad happens to uh, to Malcolm. But um, but I like that his response to her retelling of this story is, oh, it must have been the light. You definitely didn't see it. Nothing actually happened to you at all um, from Sir Malcolm. Whereas in the past and at the beginning of this season, we know that their relationship is much tighter, much closer than it had been before. And of course, he knows that she gets visions and he has always paid t- attention to them before. So she knows instantly something wrong with Sir Malcolm here. Uh, let's get out of there. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the interesting thing is here, um, you know, Vanessa does try to extract what it is that, um, Ethan as well, um, is. She knows there is something special about him from mm. a supernatural point of view. She knows that things, at least within the American, uh, Indian wars and the way he talks about how he has, um, been in those wars, he talks about being most at peace at an Indian graveyard and, mm. um, she knows there's something spiritual or supernatural about him. Whether she knows it's a werewolf, I don't know, but she does try to extract that here in this episode. And he doesn't tell her, you know, he, he certainly doesn't go down the route that he did with, uh, Sembene. Uh, and he gets himself out of the cottage just before he, um, slaughters the lambs on, on the moors. But certainly I, I thought, you know, this circling of uh, the hound and the scorpion mm-hmm. is a great descriptor for these two characters, for Definitely. sure. Definitely. Uh, I was I was intrigued by the conversation that they have between each other, Vanessa and Ethan, about what's happening to Malcolm, where Vanessa's kind of going, oh, well, Malcolm's in love and he's just forgotten about all of us. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, you know, does she really believe that or does she think something is happening here? You know, Ethan is saying that he's just trying to find his place in his world. Remember, his kids are dead. His wife's now dead. Um, he will find his place in the world and then come back to you the same way that I did when I was with Brona. So uh, I never forgot about you, Vanessa. He won't forget about you kind of thing. So uh, I like the discussion that they have. I'm just wondering why Vanessa isn't sensing sensing something a little more supernatural in what's happening with uh, with Malcolm. But I'm sure she's very hopeful that nothing that bad is happening. Yeah, that's true. That's true. This episode was really quite focused on what was going on with with Ethan and and with Vanessa. So not a huge amount more to talk about. But I do want to highlight, I suppose, the section with Lily going on her night out in London. um, Because it's quite a significant moment, I suppose, for the character of Lily. You know, she's been treated as this innocent that's just come back to life without any knowledge of anything that's been going on in her previous life. The one person who has a very strong connection to that other than Ethan is Dorian Gray. And she goes out on her date with him. Um, You can tell from Victor that he doesn't really want her anywhere outside. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. But he feels massively clingy and doesn't want to be the clingy boyfriend. So he lets her go off and do whatever she wants to do. You know, Um, she tells him, if you want me to stay here, if you want, if you want to force me to stay here with you, I will absolutely do that. But he can't do that for her. Uh, So Lily goes out on her night out with Dorian and ends off once again in the uh, in the Putney Waxwork Museum of Exposition. Um, so yes. A nice little underlining here of what's going on as we have them look at each of the gruesome moments in their life. She sees the aftermath of what happened to Ethan after she died. Ethan is the one that destroyed the uh, Mariner's Bar. She sees the grotesqueness of what happened there. And you see the reaction from Lily, a, a supposed to be a small country girl who's never seen anything, as she says, uh, seeing the destruction that took place yep. from Ethan's hand, which I like, I like the touch of that, just before she sees effectively what happened to her taking place in this scene that's been put together of Burke and Hare, the grave robbers, yep. who've been robbing bodies to give them to scientists to do their experiments on. Um, you know, it's interesting. Does she make the connection that that's what's happened to her yet? Um, does she think that she could possibly have died and come back because of this reveal of what's happening? Remember, each of the people that we've had brought back to life, uh, Proteus and the creature now, John Clare, and now her, start to piece together their own lives over time. 
does that include them being brought back to life? Do they eventually remember that they were brought back to life by the hand of Victor Frankenstein? And is this a first step that's happening here, that she is seeing grave robbers who take dead bodies, give them to scientists for experiments? Does she start to feel that, is that what happened to me? Is that why I'm so different? Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like there is a flicker of recognition there because Doreen calls uh, Burke and O'Hare the resurrection men. That's right. Um, You know, not the grave robbers as we understand them to be, uh, were they used for anatomy and mm-hmm. dissection, uh, by medical scientists. Yeah. Um, it, he calls them the resurrection men and it's, you know, they're given to scientists and we don't know what happens to them, you know, what they do with them. So, uh, there does seem to be a flicker there from, um, from Lily for sure. Yeah. Um, and certainly with the Mariners in, that's where she lives. So again, it, it's two, points uh to her uh her life in, mm-hmm. in a sense and certainly her previous life with uh, the mariners in so certainly something is being drawn out of her by dorian um e- even just the way he he says to her you know you have a coolness of a touch and you have that constant sense of discovery yeah and so she might be looking around and it might be connecting with her why at the age of, you know, a young lady um in her what mid twenties maybe mm-hmm. that she is being treated like a child. Yeah. As though she's just been born. She's just come out of the, the womb. Mm-hmm. That the you know, that so that sense of discovery that a child has. Um the coolness of touch, this idea, you know, as we saw with uh Lavinia at Putney's with John Clare, where she says there's something not right about him because yeah. the coolness of touch, it, it's like he's not alive. So these things are probably all being pieced together by uh, the regenerating neurons in Lily. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately it comes to a fairly interesting outcome uh, does, after yeah. Dorian has put her uh, into a cab to take her home. She, you know, she can't, she stops it prematurely to go in to a pub. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, pretty brutal. Um, little touches of Brona coming back in here. Um, a little bit, anyway. Yeah. With uh, Lily picking up a guy from a pub, you know, that definitely would have been something that Brona would have done in the past. You know, she's seeing a little bit of that, but it's not Brona. It's a much more murderous character. Brona would never have done this to one of her clients. You know, she went person to person trying to make money, effectively trying to make her way in London. Whereas Lily goes home with this guy to his house. And then while they're having sex, you see that moment of power switch on as she flips him over on his back and then chokes him to death. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the music is great here. Oh, it's yeah. such um, an ominous score, real sense of threat. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the thing. It's like, what does this pertain to for Lily? Is it that she will become a threat to men uh, that trade women in this way through through the brothel house? Maybe. Um, you know, so far she's been controlled. She's even been resurrected all by men. You know, um, it, again, it, it feels like it's something that Dorian is drawing out of her. Um, but certainly does it potentially put Victor in trouble? Yeah. It's certainly the only person probably that could, uh, counter this is John Clare with the same strength that she probably possesses. So mm-hmm. I'm intrigued to see what this pertains to with, with Lily. Yeah. Um, and, and how this changes her. Because as you say, it's that sudden realization. She isn't this innocent, newly resurrected person. She's mm-hmm. just gone out and done something, um, pretty horrific. Um, but to what end, for what reason? And I'm really intrigued to see this. Absolutely, yeah, because, you know, the stark contrast almost at the uh, beginning of episode six where we had the domesticity of the character of Lily, you know, getting up in the morning and cooking eggs for her new boyfriend and Victor, you know, that seemed so stark in comparison to Brona who would get up in the morning, grab a bottle of whiskey and drink it with Ethan, you know? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So different between those two characters. So, And she did shepherd's pie as well. She certainly did. She was making that, yeah. Uh, But you're wondering whether there's some significant difference within this character being trained by Victor to be a different person than she used to be. Is she starting to see the differences? Will she strike back, I suppose, against uh, everybody that's making her do the things that they want yeah. her to do, which is very different to the Brona character that we knew. She did what she needed to do 
and she did what she wanted to do, which is very different from what they're trying to make Lily do, I suppose. Um, that's it for my point. It was just, just to highlight that because I thought it was a fascinating side of that character to see uh, on screen in this episode. Uh, let's see what happens with uh, new Lily and her murder streak in the, in the other episodes. Uh, any notes from the episode? There wasn't much that I had uh, from the episode that we haven't talked about. No, I mean, the only note I had was it was a nice little reference by Mr. Lyle. Um, you have him and Victor talking about what is love except a creature waiting to mess with you effectively, <laughs> uh, you know, to cause you trauma. Uh-huh. Um, and Mr. Lyle has a nice love. Um, is the scorpion's sting in ancient Egypt that once it's done, it, it it's infected you. Uh, this idea of love as an infection. So mm-hmm. uh, this is a, another nice little reference back to scorpions, but also, uh, you know, ancient Egypt, um, and, and th- this idea of Amun Ra and Amutet, um, conjoining and, and wiping out everyone on earth other than the, the true believers or, or their followers. Yeah. Um, you know, he calls, him legion because he can come in many forms Mm -hmm. Uh, so again it's just another little reminder that you know like in season one with all the hieroglyphics on the the vampire's body uh, there is still that element of the ancient egyptian uh tale of amun ra and amatet conjoining and effectively being the the bringers of destruction. Yes, yes, or the master and uh, and Vanessa, obviously. Yes, <laughs> from this exactly. So, uh, we'll see. I do want to call out the one line from uh, the dancing uh, between Miss Ives and uh, and Ethan, where Ethan has just taught her how to shoot a gun, and the best thing to do when you're killing somebody is not look in your opponent's eyes. <laughs> and we have <laughs> yeah. the beautifully delivered line from uh, from Eva Green of dancing is the opposite of homicide. You always look in your opponent's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> what great. a great way to yeah. teach Ethan how to dance. Great line. Great line. <laughs> That's it for part four of our discussions about Petty Dreadful season two. This episode, we discussed episodes five to seven. Overall, middle part of Petty Dreadful season two, John, what are you thinking about the middle section of the season? I think it, I think it's building really nicely uh, around uh, the witches I, I, and, and Ethan's story. You know, I, I really, really did um, enjoy this. Mm-hmm. I would, I think at this stage, be giving it about four to four and a half dizzying panoramas uh, out of five. I, like um, I, I really liked it. I think um, episode seven, going back to the cut wife's cottage, um, it's an interesting take, probably, I think, with with the longer series of 10 episodes for mm-hmm. season two, you know, they're able to do a bit more of this and it really adds to the character. But it, it felt like it slightly took out of me that whole bloody rain in the ball right. uh, and this the intensity of the witches coming at her. I, I you know this fight for their life but Mm -hmm. i I think there needed to be this reconnection to the cottage and this book of the dead for sure because i think that's their only option to to dealing with the witch's coven um and i i like they drew out um vanessa's fear of dolls because of course uh that will prove a bit of an obstacle if she is to go and uh sort of neutralize her fetish down in in that uh basement yes it might might have might have i wonder if the reason why they did this in episode seven having the moment where vanessa kills sir, jo- sir joffrey uh, i wonder is it because of the longer season whereas if this had been season one where we only had eight episodes it most likely would have been one of hecate's sisters that vanessa would have killed uh using that book taking one of them out and then moving on whereas if you have that longer series you're able to have a completely different storyline which is what this is this is showing you her tooling up and getting ready to go after them but not necessarily involving the witches. So, uh, so maybe that's what it is in this episode. I've really enjoyed looking back at, at this season of, uh, of Penny Dreadful. Every episode feels so interesting to watch again, uh, knowing how the, how the series is going and how it's wrapping up and how beautifully written it is by John Logan. Really, really enjoying, uh, this time going back. We hope you are enjoying as well. If you want to subscribe to the podcast to get the rest of the Penny Dreadful podcast, make sure you go over to tvpodcastindustries.com to get the rest of our discussions about Penny Dreadful. Season two, we'll be back with the other three episodes, our final part of season two of uh, of Penny Dreadful discussions. Yes, thank you so much, fellow Darklings, for joining us. It is a pleasure, as always, speaking to you in the Verbius Diablo. Uh, (laughs) So looking forward to speaking to you again soon. 
Remember, fellow Darklings, keep watching, keep listening, and keep screaming. Don't play the podcast backwards. <laughs> Talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>